My guest today is Brent Ozar. Brent, how are you, sir? Very good, sir. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I've been wanting to get you on my show for a long time, but you are a hard man to track down because you're all over the world. Every time I look, I you're somewhere else. Lot. Yes. I love travel. You know, the past couple of years have been tough, so I ended up moving to Iceland for a while just to be able to travel inside of that country. Uh, but now, yeah, now I'm down in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, right by the ocean today. Beautiful. Uh, is there any difference gorgeous. between Iceland and Cabo San Lucas? Just a little bit. A completely different wardrobe, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> different languages. Yeah, it's amazing. They both look like movie sets. You know, it looks like something straight out of a movie. And that's, I always want to be inspired visually wherever I go. Uh, different uh, regions of the Game of Thrones, probably. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I saw tons of Game of Thrones locations when I was in Iceland, and it was uh, just jaw dropping. The whole entire country looks like a movie set. Very cool. Uh, now you you didn't change jobs as you were moving around the world, right? What, I did what not. No, I've been. I am a, a database performance consultant. I make Microsoft SQL Server go faster, so people call me when their databases are on fire. Oh my gosh, we're hitting some kind of performance wall, and then I try to make as few changes as possible in order to help them getting back to shipping features and adding things for their their application rather than screwing around with the database. Almost everything that I do is emergencies, is kind of like an emergency room surgeon. So I can work from wherever. I just, you know, as long as I have a fast internet connection. And it happens that we have fiber internet here in Cabo. I had fiber internet through most of Iceland. So that's basically how I choose my destinations. Are they, re do they have really <laughs> fast fiber internet and uh, really epic scenery? So, yes. You have to be around when somebody says, shoot, get Brent. Yes. This thing it's is a disaster. Never no one ever plans their emergencies in advance. It's always, oh my God. They, and people hold off, you know, it's like the medical thing. Everybody holds off going to the doctor until it's way too late. And then they're like, hey, I'm bleeding from all these places. Can you do something about this? No one plans uh, ahead. Yeah. No, so I, I uh, by profession, I'm a software developer. So I work with databases a lot, uh, but I'm not really a database guy. At least I haven't been yeah, since my yeah. Fox Pro days, which was oh, a long time ago. Yeah. Wow, yes. <laughs> um, yes. How, how important are databases to software developers? I, I, really, I like using the term persistence layer because it's whenever you're working in development, you want a place to store stuff and you mm -hmm. want to make sure that it's there and that it's quickly accessible whenever you need it. It's usually not something when you're a developer that you want to make your career out of. You really want to make the front end app. You want to make something that people can put their hands on, can click around in. And so the database is almost like an afterthought. And I think that that for a lot of us, it's great that the databases are so reliable these days that for a lot of people, they can be an afterthought. I love that the people don't can, can go a really long ways without doing extensive architecture, without thinking too deeply. You can just throw stuff into a database and go a really long way because databases aren't so new anymore. Uh, but that's why people hit walls is they go really long ways and then they go, wait a minute, I can't pull things out quickly or enough. Or your application goes viral, you know, all of a sudden everybody wants to use it and the database back end, just the way that you designed it or the way that you built it is just not able to keep up with your extensive number of customers, which is a great problem to have. All right. Now, if I'm a software developer, I'm building an application, and I know I need to persist data somewhere. How do I know which database to choose? There's so many out there. Number one by far is pick the database that you've already got some experience with. My goal as a database person, you know, of course, you would think I make my living on the Microsoft database stack. I think it's wonderful. But pick the database that you've already got experience in. Because if you go learning a new database every week, you're going to screw it up. You're going to screw up basic implementation decisions. Whereas the more that you're used to something, you can use the same database that you've always used. And sure, there are going to be all kinds of databases popping up all over the place that appear to have exactly what you want. There's a learning curve there. It's going to take you some time to ship. I want you to ship your application as quickly as possible. And the more experience that you get with the same database, I don't care which one it is. You know, there are tons of databases out there. 
I don't, I use, of course, Microsoft SQL Server and Azure mm-hmm. SQL DB. I don't care if you use MySQL, Postgres, you know, uh, SQL Lite. I, as long as you pick one and stick with it for a while, that's the place to start with. Mm. Uh, what about my architecture? If I'm, uh, is that is that a factor in how I design my database, select my database, design my queries? It's the architecture thing's so tricky because it's real easy to armchair architect things. Everybody thinks they need pod Kubernetes and containers and all kinds of things these days for a hello world application. And you can go a really long way with a really simple database. When you first get started, think of databases as small, medium, and large. Everybody thinks that they're going to have big data, but really think of the numbers 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000. For small, in terms of size, 1 to 10 gigabytes in a database, you don't really have to worry that much about architecture. Now, granted, every app begins small, and it grows larger over time, But if you start building some demo stuff and you realize that it looks like you've only got a gigabyte or two of data, you don't have to worry that much about architecture in the beginning. Because after all, how often do your application, does your application actually go viral? A lot of times applications just never get that much adoption, whether it's inside an enterprise or whether it's a small business app, or you do the design where you put every client inside their own database. I'm a huge fan of that architecture. And that's probably the biggest architecture decision you have to make. Are you going to pile everybody in the same database? Or is there some way that you can put every client or every group of users inside their own database? That one decision can come back to haunt you later on. Uh, If you put every client inside their own database, it's real easy to spread databases over all kinds of places, you know, to get lots of Azure SQL DBs if you uh, break it across a lot of SQL servers. Um, If you put everything in one database, it's easier development, but it will be harder performance tuning later. It'll come back to haunt you as the size grows. The size of your data is a huge component in determining what your architecture is going to be. Yeah, when I talk about the, the, those small, medium, large, is it one to ten gigabytes? Then, then ten to a hundred gigabytes, I think of as the medium tier, and a hundred gigabytes to one terabyte is the large tier. And their database is much larger than that. We mm. refer to those as very large databases or VLDBs. But the architecture advice you give somebody is so different in each of those tiers. Um, I will give different answers if someone says that they have a one to 10 gigabyte database as opposed to 100 gigs to a terabyte. So know whether you're small, medium, and large as you're making architecture decisions. Don't base your architecture decisions based off of someone who's in a completely different tier. You know, I hear people all the time going, well, what did Stack Overflow do? You know, or what yeah. does, you know, like I think that's a different size. It's a different tier. They're right. the top 50 websites in the world. You don't have the problems that they have. Hopefully you do someday. When you do, <laughs> there will be people like me who are willing to take your money and help you solve that problem. <laughs> uh, I know you were mentioning uh, you're a SQL Server guy, and then yep. you started talking about some of the other databases. And I couldn't help notice that you were mostly listing relational databases like SQL Server. <laughs> Is yes. That, are, is, are relational databases the best? Oh, man. I, I almost think of them as expensive sports cars. <laughs> they're really fast. They're really cool, but they are really expensive. And if you don't need one, don't use one. A lot of people who have, say, Ferrari or Lamborghini collections, they have other cars that they use on a day-to-day basis for things like dropping the kids off at school going to Costco or Sam's that's, Club. That's what I do. I put, keep my Ferrari right? in the garage. Ferrari, <laughs> Ferrari collection in the garage. Exactly. If you want to take care of it, it's nice. It'll be there, but it's also expensive to maintain. You have to hire specialists to deal with it. Um, it's the same thing with databases. If you can, and this sounds backwards from a relational person to say, if you can keep it out of the relationship, relational database, you should. If you're not doing joins to it, don't put it in the relational database. You know, for example, if you have things that you need to cache, if you have a queuing system or a polling system, uh, if you want to store files, can relational databases do that? Absolutely. Can you take your Ferrari to the grocery store? Absolutely. 
Should you do that? It's probably not the wisest thing to do. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and so joining is, uh, is actually defines relationships. That's really the, the key is do I exactly. have multiple tables relate to one another? Exactly. And, and just because they're conceptually related, sure, all your data is conceptually related, but just because it's conceptually related doesn't mean it needs to live in the same you know, exact spot. Uh, caching things, queuing, if you have a list of queue of things that you have to go and do, XML or JSON data, if you want to store files, it doesn't have to be in a relational database when you're not joining to it because it's so cheap to store files up in the cloud. There are queuing services up in the cloud and they don't have all the painful struggles that relational, I don't know why I always think of myself as a relational database, but they don't have all the painful struggles that scaling that relational databases do. When you want to bring a whole lot of relational database servers into the same mix, it's expensive, it takes people, there. it's doable, it happens every day all over the world, right. but it's just not as easy as scaling a file share. You know, you right. want to scale a file share, anybody can do it, and there are huge file services up in the cloud. Cool. What are some of the other things that a developer needs to take into account when they're working with databases? You know, I said size in terms of, uh, of uh, small, medium, and large. Queries per second is another one. Uh, so if you do 1 to 100 or 1 to 10 queries per second, uh, 10 to 100 queries per second, and 100 to 1,000 queries per second, I'm going to give you very different advice depending on which category that you're in. In 1 to 10 queries per second, I don't care if you use SQLite. You know, you can use a, you can use a browser-based database and you're going to be fine. And uh, when you get to 10 to 100 queries per second and you want to sustain that, that's where you're going to have to buckle up and start paying more attention. And 100 to 1,000 queries per second is totally doable with relational databases. A client's doing over 100,000 queries per second. But when you get between 100 and 1,000 queries per second, it's so easy for a bad query to take down your database. You have to pay such attention to performance. So as people go up those tiers, as you go 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, that's when I'm like, hey, stop for a second and think, can I cache stuff? Can I cache things in the front end? Can I use things like Redis as a caching service so that I don't have to go to the back to the database yeah. every time? Just because it's in the database and it was queried a second ago doesn't mean it's free for you to go get it again. You know, CPU mm -hmm. power is a big defining bottleneck uh, for mm -hmm. us. Are there any uh, non-technical issues that uh, developers well, deal with with databases? Yeah, I wish we didn't have to, and this really sucks, and it hate, I hate to even bring it up, but you have to know whether or not your data is subject to regulations. These days, every governmental body wants to get their nose in every kind of data. And look, I'm a huge fan of privacy, says the guy with a blog and uploads all his breakfast photos <laughs> to Instagram. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of privacy. I, I believe that you should be in control of your data. Well, on the flip side of that, as a developer, you have to be, I'm not asking you to fix it, but you have to be aware of what regulations your data is subject to. Right. Because if your data is subject to regulations, there are some databases that make it easier to comply with those regulations. Look, I know somebody wanted to open, you know, build a NoSQL database. People get frustrated. Oh my God, databases are so expensive. I can build one myself. You know, and sure enough, that's how you get things like MongoDB. But you know, these things get built really quickly. They don't have the compliance and security things built in mm. that a traditional enterprise database does. Mm. I know I'm a SQL Server guy. It sounds like I'm saying this to be a cheerleader. I am not saying you have to use specific databases but know what the regulations are and what you would have to do in order to be compliant before it's too late, you know, before you end up on the front page of the paper because you have an unsecured database that you're like, no one would ever look here, you know, and next thing you know, you're, you're getting called in front of some governmental body. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of cloud providers, uh, Azure, AWS, they provide a level of security and a level of compliance for that, but that's never enough. It's still up to you, the developer, the DBA, the the, the people yeah. that are deploying this to, to yeah. be cognizant of this and be diligent. And 
I think it's so much easier, this will get me into trouble, I think it's so much easier to rely on more stuff that the cloud providers do. I know a long time ago when we would build web apps, we'd be like, I nobody could build it as secure as I would. You know, yeah. I've got it. And, and I, built my, I wrote my own encryption mechanism. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No one could find a, a flaw in this plan. You know, and I, I look, I'm like, you don't have anywhere near the level of resources that the big companies do. Sure. The more crutches that you can lean on for the stuff that doesn't really make you money, you know, at the end of the day, encryption doesn't make you money. Secure file storage doesn't make you money. It will cost you money if you screw it up. Why not lean on something robust that somebody else has already built? And that's why I also believe that uh, in this day and age, in the year 2022, when you're picking a database, the default should be a database someone else manages. You know, now I'm not pitching my services. I don't do that. But uh, a database where someone else manages things like patching for you. Because right. keeping stuff like patching up to date is a giant pain in the rear. And it doesn't directly make you money. It's this is no. stuff usually totally unrelated to actual your actual business. Yeah, I I am I'm probably the best example of that. I am a database person. I've been a database administrator for over two decades now. But when I build applications, I do not build my own database servers. I use hosted databases up in the cloud because I don't want to be on call when this stuff breaks. I don't want to do right. patching on Saturday night. I want to be right back there at the pool bar drinking margaritas, getting hammered out of my mind. I, got I want to be there to with you. <laughs> yeah, right. Especially now with the, with the snow in Chicago, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, sure. oh, no, it's uh, it's actually just as sunny here. It's like uh, 85 <laughs> degrees here in Je February in Chicago. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Freak sunshine came through and rolled through everything. Yeah. I may have made up part of that story. <laughs> uh, my, so my last question, it's been two decades you've been doing this working with yeah. databases uh are you having fun oh my gosh i i love databases so much i got my start as a developer back in the late 1990s and i suck at learning languages i <laughs> suck at learning. yeah i say this in mexico i know maybe 200 words of spanish you know i can't get by on the street if anybody asks me something tricky um, i know enough to get myself into trouble learning languages is hard learning frameworks is hard Databases are a phenomenal career. If you're a developer and you're like, oh, I kind of find that I'm enjoying this stuff, getting data from point A to point B, rendering data in a way that's intuitive to people, finding insights in data, or just making databases go faster was the thing that I fell in love with. Um, if you like that, it's a phenomenal career. There are tons of careers around data. If you're doing development, don't just think that I have to do front end stuff or I have to do infrastructure. There are so many careers around data. Keep pulling strings about uh, what you love in data. And there's probably a career doing just that one part. When I got started doing development, I would never imagine that there were entire careers where you could just make databases go faster. And now that's all I do. And I just utterly adore it. It's incredible. And you're writing about it and you're speaking about this. Uh, what's yeah. what's your blog? Uh, Brentozar.com, B-R-E-N-T-O-Z-A-R.com. I give away open source scripts, tons of YouTube videos, got an active YouTube channel, all kind of GitHub. You can check me over on GitHub as well. We've got a huge uh, library of open source scripts. So I'm all about anything that I can do to head off emergencies before you have to hire me. <laughs> right. Are you doing any speaking? I am. I'm going to Sequel Bits this month. Uh, well, I, tech, I fly over this month, and the Sequel Bits is in March. And then the Pass Summit in November, I believe, in Seattle. I'm super excited mm -hmm. to have real world things or in person yeah. things happening. Yeah. Again, real world's the wrong term. <laughs> I am as well. Yeah. I went to I went to uh, the Code Mash a few weeks oh. ago. It was a lot of fun. Oh, it was great to man. see people and reconnect. Nothing, nothing's better than that light that you see in people's eyes when you see each other and you're like, oh, hey, you know, that's, that's magical. Pixels yeah, only get you so far. Especially after this long layoff of yes. uh, isolation. Yes. Uh, well, Brent, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so Good much for you your do, time. David. And uh, you, you try to stay pleasure. warm. Yeah, I'll, I'll somehow I'll struggle through. <laughs> yes. Thanks, man. <laughs>
one of my favorite things about this industry is the friends that you make along the way. Technology is the thing that binds us together, but we're friends based on things that have nothing to do with technology. The games that we play, the places we like to go, the foods we eat and drink, that's the things that really build friendships inside this industry. We work together on the same technology, but you really become friends based off of what's away from that screen.